Welcome to Denver Startup Week. And welcome to the Product Track Keynote event. Uh, I'm Adam Tornis. I'm the president of Colorado Product. Uh, and I am going to guess, kind of MC this event uh, for us today. To start off, Dan, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, we need to thank our primary sponsors. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank all of Denver Startup Week's sponsors and organizers as well. Uh, specifically, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Amazon, our title sponsors, Capital One, Dell, and Denver Downtown Partnership, and our track sponsor in Pi Insurance. Let's give them all a quick round of applause for making this event and this week possible. Uh, well, I'm not going to name them individually. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of Denver Startup Week's other sponsors as well um, for making this week possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as has been the case for the next last seven or eight years, uh, this year's keynote presentation is sponsored and presented by Colorado Product. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with Colorado Product, uh, it's a 501c3 charitable organization focused on the growth and development of the practice and uh, people that practice product management in, the, in Colorado's front range. Uh, we host events and a variety of different programs throughout the year. Um, if you're interested, in learning more, please check us out at coloradoproduct.com. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors as well, including Nihilus, who has a banner out front, uh, Crafted, and Stream.io. And uh, before, or be sure to join Colorado Product for our event after this, which is a happy hour. Uh, Dan will be present as well for that. Uh, it's at the HomeBot office immediately following this event. Uh, check us out on meetup.com to get the specific details for that. Um, with all of that said, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Please give a warm welcome to Dan Olson. Uh, Dan is a product management trainer, consultant, and speaker. He wrote a best-selling product management book called The Lean Product Playbook. And through his talks and interactive training workshops, Dan helps companies build great products and strong product teams. He's also the founder of an organization very similar to Colorado Product, leading an 11,000 member lean product meetup in the Bay Area. So thank you, Dan. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Are, are you as excited as I am to be together in person? I'm like so excited to be in, in person and in Denver outside of the Bay Area. So welcome everybody. I'm excited to share. Can you guys hear okay in the back? All right, cool, excellent. I feel like with that. It sounds like we're kind of a little <laughs> driving speaker action going. Okay, um, so I'm excited to talk with you all today about um, sharing some advice on how to define a winning product strategy. Um, real quick about my background. I start out with a technical background. Um, my parents got me a computer when I was a kid. I'm really glad they did because I was comfortable with coding, although I mainly played games on it. Uh, and then I was electrical engineering major. I had a really cool job out of undergrad in the Navy designing submarines. And then I moved out to Silicon Valley to get more in the business side of things and earn an MBA. I've been living out in Silicon Valley ever since. Um, when I was in business school trying to figure out what I was going to do after graduation, I learned about this new, exciting, emerging career called product management. And the more I learned about it, the more it sounded really interesting. And I asked everybody, hey, where's the best place to learn product management since I had never done it? And at the time, pretty much most people said A into it. So I was fortunate to get a job at Intuit where I worked for a while. And then I was a product leader at several startups. Um, as Adam mentioned, I wrote the Lean Product Playbook. Most of the advice I'm going to share with you it comes from the book. There's some new case studies that aren't in the book as well. Um, and I mainly spend my time um, training product teams and consulting with companies. And as Adam mentioned, I, eight and a half years ago, I did form a community called the Lean Product Meetup that meets monthly. It used to meet in person, now it's in person. I'll share, it, it's, it's, sorry, now it's virtual. So we have people from all over the states that join each month. I'll share the link later on. And that's my website right there if you want to see my ta other talks and things. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of different companies and a lot of different spaces, B2C, B2B. So I've seen a lot of different patterns. And um, real quick, who's a product manager? Here's who works in product management. Okay, excellent. We have a lot of product managers here. Okay, so, and 
I guess we have some non-product managers here too. That's cool. Welcome. You you want to be on this? Yeah, you come over. This you know, you come over. This is the good side. You want to you know, former engineers, former designers. It's all good. Um, but since we do have so many product people here, I guess even though we have some non-product people here, I'm gonna go ahead and share like one of the most closely guarded secrets of product management. Maybe if you're not a PM, just kind of do you know earmuffs or something real quick. But it's basically the product manager's motto. Now some of you may have heard me say this already, but it's a bit like Spider-Man's motto. Do we have any Marvel fans who can tell me Spider-Man's motto here? Yeah. We got. Yeah, go for it. Oh, with great power comes That's right, with great power comes great responsibility. That is Spider-Man's motto. The product manager's motto is similar, it's just a little bit different, and it's with great responsibility comes no power because we're on the hook for delivering all this stuff and OKRs and shipping stuff, but nobody reports to us. We can't just boss people around. So we have to influence without authority, right? So um, we're, we're laughing on the outside, but we're crying a little bit on the inside, right? Why does it have to be so tough? Why do people have to, have to you know, beg, borrow, and steal? Um, so one of the things responsible, especially as you move up in your career, is product strategy. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. And I wanna kinda explain it in the framework of the main framework for my book, which is the product market fit pyramid. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a five layer framework uh, in the shape of a pyramid that's to capture what are, the, what are the key hypotheses that you need to get right enough in order to achieve product market fit. So uh, I'll go over it real quick and then I'll show you a product strategy. We'll dive into product strategy. At the foundation of the pyramid, um, like a real pyramid, each layer is meant to build on, build on the layers beneath it, is the target customer. Who are we trying to create for whose problems are we trying to solve right everything the next layer up is for that customer what are their underserved needs and there are two words there needs uh, those of you that seen some of my other talks and I'm going to talk about this in a sec no before we go rushing off and building features and solutions we should be thinking about customer needs and problems and then the word underserved, which is you know a given need might be well served or not so well served I'm actually going to not cover that tonight that I cover that in some of my other talks with my importance versus satisfaction framework but taken together, these two layers are the market. And if you look in an economics or marketing textbook, it'll say that a uh, market is people that share a set of common needs. And you don't actually control the market in the sense that they make the decision whether or not to buy your product and use your product and keep using your product. You can pick which market you want to target, but what's in your direct control are the three product layers. Now, the first product layer is the value proposition. Now in an ideal world, this is tightly coupled with the needs, but we leave a gap here because we don't know if it is or not, right? And your value prop is basically which needs are you gonna tell customers your problem delivers on and how are you gonna do so in a way that's better and different than the competition. The next layer up is your feature set or functionality. The way to think about it is to enjoy the benefits in your value prop. And this is where everybody's favorite comes in here. Um, we're not going to talk about that today. Maybe at the happy hour we'll have some MVP therapy and see if we can all get everybody to agree on what it actually means, right? And then the final layer is user experience, right? So the way to think about it is the user interacts with the UX to use your features to enjoy the benefits in your value proposition. And product market fit is just, okay, we're going after this market and we're going after it with this set of hypotheses and product execution. How well does it resonate with the product target market that we're going after. And again, you can think about this as the five key hypotheses that you need to get right enough. They don't have to be perfect, but if any one of these five is significantly off, it's gonna prevent you from achieving product market fit. Now, product strategy lives squarely right here. I call it value proposition, but it's really product strategy. It's like, how are we better or different than the competition, right? How is our product gonna be better or different than the competition? So that's what I wanna focus on today, all right? Um, so let's see, I'd love to hear people, when you think, uh, sh when you hear product strategy, maybe shout out like a one or two word answer, what, what comes to mind for you when you hear product strategy? Roadmap, roadmap. okay, roadmap, nice. Jira, no, okay. Uh, what else? <laughs> Achieving your mission, great. Making decisions. Making decisions, yeah, definitely decisions, strategic decision making, excellent, yeah? Focus, Focus solving problems, that's great, yeah. How few companies have them, that's right, that's right. I, I was giving a talk once and I'm like, you know, like who's, who, who's happy with their product strategy? And like a bunch of hands went up, way more hands went up than usual. I'm like, what's going on? I realized, oh, I'm at a product leaders media uh, conference. They all think they have a product strategy. They're not gonna admit they don't have a product strategy, right? It's all like VPs and CPOs. I'm like, okay, that, that was the wrong question to ask this group. All right, what else comes to mind? How you achieve your goals, How you achieve your goals? cool. Anything else? Defining where you're going, cool. 
vision. I got mission. We got vision. Excellent. We got a mission statement. We got a vision. Awesome. Yes. Okay, how you do future set? Cool. All right, good. So some good answers. There's one answer in particular I was looking for right in here. I'll get to it in a sec. So, you know, at a high level, it's your plan for how you're going to win, right? You're in the market with these other products out there. What's our plan for how we're going to win? And a lot of the stuff that I advocate doing is very customer-centric, right? And, you, and in fact, into it, where I started my career, we were one of the few companies that, like, continuously beat out Microsoft time and time again, years over years. They're, they're notorious for pounding people into the pavement. Like they eventually will grind you down. And the number one reason why is because we are so customer centric. Um, so you want to always be, you know, focus on customers and not just look at the competition, but this is where competitive analysis should come in. You should be really clear on, hey, what is the competition doing? How are we going to be better? This is the thing I was looking for. Long term versus short term. Nobody said it, but as PMs, we often get pulled into the short term, right? You got to go to this meeting. We got to finish this sprint, right? It's like the time scale we're operating in is hours, days, weeks, if you're lucky, right? And I'm a bit of a physics geek. So when I think of short term, I think of like a black hole and like the gravitational pull of a black hole. The short term will dominate everything if you let it, right? You know, there's always be another Jira ticket to fill out, another email to do, another meeting to go to, another stand up to go to. Right? So really, when do you have the time to pull your head out of the day-to-day -day fray and, and take, have permission to think long-term? That's what strategy is all about. It's a key thing of strategy. Otherwise, that's what tactics. What are you doing every day? Tactics. Strategy is longer term. My favorite definition of strategy is saying no, right? Um, is anybody working B2B or enterprise here? Do we have any B2B enterprise salespeople here? Sorry. Okay, so when our friends in enterprise sales go out and call on a customer, and the customer goes, yeah, but is that solution going to have feature A in it? Before I sign this contract for $5 million, is your, fe is your product going to have feature A? What do they say? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, sign the contract. Sign the co hey guys, I signed a $5 million contract with Google. We got to build feature A. And then the next, next salesperson, they're calling on IBM, and IBM goes, yeah, but is it going to have feature B in it? Before I sign this contract, what do they say? They say yes. I'm just making fun of our friends. They're incentivized to say yes to everything because they have quotas in it, right? That's not being strategic. Strategic means that you're saying no. You're having some kind of point of view about, yes, this fits our strategy. No, this doesn't fit our strategy. And this is where I like to bring up a Steve Jobs quote. I think someone over here said focus. Steve Jobs has a great quote on focus, which is, hey, people think focus means saying yes to the thing that you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the 100 other good ideas that there are. Innovation is saying no to 1,000 things. So I like to just paraphrase it by saying strategy means saying no, right? If you're saying yes to every single customer request, you're not being strategic. Now, look, we want to be customer centric, but we also want to have a vision and a mission like people were saying, right? And look, it's easy, it's easy to say no to bad ideas, right? People have dumb ideas or bad ideas, that's easy. But you see this is no to the 100 other good ideas. He's acknowledging that there are a lot of other good ideas out there. And then the final thing I would say, you might have heard about this from Amazon, like type one versus type two decisions, is decisions that are not easy to reverse. If you can just change your mind the next day and flip flop, I would argue that's not really a strategic decision. Someone said decision making, right? We're making these decisions, right? Um, okay, so we want our, and somebody else said, focused on customer problems, right, and customer needs. So yes, we want our strategy to be grounded in customer needs and problems. So that's where this idea of problem space versus solution space that I love to talk about um, comes up. So who's familiar with problem space here? I'm just curious, who's familiar with the term problem space? Oh, we got a few hands, good. I mean, it's more than before. I'm excited to see more and more people talking about it since I've been talking about it for a while. Let me explain what the difference between problem space and solution space. Okay, problem space is a customer problem, need, or benefit that the product should address, right? If I felt like, you know, it's just too hard to share photos with your friends. I want to make it easier to share photos with your friends. That statement is a problem space statement, right? I'm, I'm focusing on the problem I want to solve. I'm not saying how I'm going to solve it, right? I'm not saying I'm going to build an app to do it. I'm going to have a website or whatever. I haven't said how. And I'm sure, who's familiar with the Agile user story template? As a blank, I want a blank so I can blank. More people? Okay, good, right? So this is the template to follow to write good user stories. It helps you be customer-centric because it starts out with as a blank type of customer, right? And really the essence of the problem space in that story is so I can. Like, why does the user care about this? How is this going to create value? So by following that template and filling out the so I can section, you really helps you focus on the problem space. Now, in contrast, 
Solution space is a specific implementation or design to address the need. If the very next thing I said after, you know, I want to make it easier to share photos with your friends, and last week I launched an app on the App Store that does that, that app would be in the solution space. Obviously, right? I built, I built a solution, I built a product, I built an app, it's in the solution space. Or even if I didn't do any coding yet, but one of my friends was a designer and she gave me a set of mock-ups for this app that would make it easy to share photos with your friends, that set of mock-ups would be in the solution space. And as you can imagine, there can be you know, thousands, millions of different solutions for a given problem. Right? And the, real, the key reason I share this is because far too often product teams go rushing into solution space and start talking about features and what we should build without spending enough time thinking about the problem space. And, it's, and I understand why, like we live in the solution space, like we live, so it's not like you're born with this kind of, you know, uh, ability to tell the two apart, but good product people, as they develop in their career, they can kind of tell when, what's going on. If somebody says, hey, I think we should add a drop down, you know, they go, the little yellow flag goes up, they just proposed a solution, you know, and, and I'll talk about how to get people to, to talk more about uh, problems versus solutions. And as I like to say, you know, some, many of the people on the team, their job is squarely in the solution space. So developers, they have to ship code, working code, in the solution space. So they're definitely in the solution space. Designers have to create mockups, right, and pixels in the solution space. So they're in the solution space. So it kind of raises the question, well, who on the product team should be in charge of the problem space? We all think it's the product managers. Like our job is to know the problem space, right? We're, we're not coding the product. Maybe we're you know, debugging it. We're not designing it. Maybe we're doing some wireframes or critiquing the design. Our main value add is defining the problem space to the team, right? Of course, we can contribute and uh, have opinions on the other things. And as I like to just summarize everyone's job, what do developers do in one word? They develop. What do designers do in one word? They design. So if I had to pick one word for what product manager's job is, I wouldn't pick manage, that's too vague. I would pick the word define. It's define who our customers are and what their needs are. That's really the biggest value add that PMs uh, can, can bring to their team. Um, and just to illustrate this point and make it a little more memorable, uh, when NASA was sending astronauts into space at first, they knew that the pens that we use here that rely on gravity wouldn't work in space. And I'll say right off the bat, if you Google this, you end up on some urban legend that says, hey, NASA didn't do this, and NASA didn't pay for this. It's totally true. NASA didn't do it, and NASA didn't pay for it. But one of NASA's subcontractors, on their own, NASA didn't tell them to, they said, you know what? I think we can invent a pen that right, right in space. And they spent a million dollars in the 60s of their own money to and a space pen, right? And I have one, somebody gave me one at a talk, so it actually works. I haven't been in space to verify myself, but you can write upside down so you can tell it works without gravity, and it's because it has a little gas pressurized gas canister in there, right? Well, the Russians, they had astronauts too, and they, know, they knew that basically the pens wouldn't work for them, but instead of uh, inventing a space pen, they sent their astronauts into space with a pencil. And you can actually get a Russian space pen. It's just a joke. It's a cheeky joke, poking fun. It's just a red pencil in a box, poking fun at it. So why do I say this? You know, the obvious thing is, well, if, if, the, if for a second these are both equally good solutions to the problem we're trying to solve, and I'm telling the story in a very specific way, there are other needs and problems that it needs to address, then obviously the one that didn't take all that money is higher ROI. But the real reason I, I share it is, is even when you're trying, you say, okay, I get it. I'm going to try to think about the problem space. It's so easy, solution space thinking is so pernicious, it's easy for solution pollution to happen. That's what I call solution pollution, right? So when the head of that company, let's talk about the guys, when, when he was saying his requirements or problem space, and he said, hey, you know what? I think we can invent a pen that writes in space. He had some solution pollution in his requirements. What was the pollution that he had? Yeah, pen, right? He kind of baked the solution into the requirements. Now, I'll forgive him because it was Mr. Fisher of the Fisher Pen Company. All he did his whole life was design and build pens, so I understand why he had tunnel vision on a pens. But if we want to say, well, how can we do a better job kind of staying in the problem space? If he'd just been a little vague and waved his hands and said a way to write in space, that would be less solution-y than saying a pen that writes in space, right? And it's going to happen. You're going to get solution pollution on your team. You're going to be in a meeting and someone's going to say, I think we should add this feature. I think we should add this drop down, right? Um, and it's fine. It's fine. You, hopefully you'll build an awareness or you already have the awareness and you can say, okay, the way to kind of get them to pivot back and think about it, what the customer problem is, just say, hey, why? Hey, I hear you think, saying we should add a drop down. Why do you think that would be valuable to a customer? And you get them to stop and think and explicitly think about the problem space, right? 
And so even with the astronaut example, we can do better. By asking why, we can go deeper into the problem space. So we had a pen that writes in space, which is pretty solution-y. We have a way to write in space, which is better, but we can do even better than that. Why do astronauts need a way to write in space? What's like the fundamental need? Hmm? Take note, yeah, do, write down, no, document information and refer to it later, something like that, right? Well, guess what? And it's a little subtle, but now we've taken out the word writing. It's just like, hey, I need to be able to record information and refer to it later. Maybe that opens the door for some crazy Siri Alexa thing. You know, maybe it wasn't technologically possible at the time, but it's a way to get deeper into the space. Now, I know this never happens in your teams, but I've seen other teams' Jiras and Trello boards, and I see stuff like this. Add a drop down that does blah, 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 right? Build a wizard that does this. Add an API call. Add a hamburger menu. Create. Are these solutions or problems? These are solutions, right? So it's funny because when I ask everybody, who knows the Agile user story template, we get like 90 plus percent of people, oh yeah, I know. For some reason, when that Jira pop-up comes up, get amnesia, just build me the hamburger, give me the thing I want, build the thing I want. Give me the thing, right? And it, you know, there's, th there's negative side effects too, which is like if you just say what the feature you want is, then you know, on a product team, we've all got to make you know, dozens of decisions on our own. We can't always get together and powwow and collaborate on every single little decision. If that developer just has like a little bit to go on and they've got to make some calls and they don't know why they're building what they're building or they don't know what problem it's going to solve, they're not empowered to really make those good decisions, right? And the thing about Jira is it lets you have a proper user story and then you can use subtasks to put in the dev tasks. So the message is not, hey, never think about solution space. Obviously, we're eventually going to spec out what the tasks or the dev tasks need to are. But the point is spend enough time in the problem space before you do, right? That's the idea. So I want to illustrate it with another product uh, you know, from Intuit that I worked that, that I didn't work on, but it's from Intuit. TurboTax. Has anyone used TurboTax in the last couple years? OK, good. So I'm going to need some audience participation for this. It's an application, it's a program, so it's clearly in the solution space, right? Right. It competes with another solution, uh, tax cut. And usually when you're building a new product or feature, and by the way, it's called the product market fit pyramid or the lean product process, but you can use it for at the feature level too. You want to start in the problem space, make sure you're clear, and then brainstorm benefit, brainstorm solutions. But you can also reverse engineer. So for those of you that use TurboTax in the last couple of years, let's try to build our problem space skills, not mention features or solutions. What benefits did it provide? Why was it valuable to you? What do we got? Speed and low cost. Speed and low cost. I don't need to know the tax law. Excellent. Easy to, Easy to use. Accuracy. Accuracy. Awesome. Maximize, Maximize my refund. Excellent. I don't need to spend money on an accountant. On an accountant. Someone said free. Okay. Remembers last year's information. Cool. So I'm going to use my little Y hack on that because sometimes they get people, like my engineer will be like, data import from the year before. And then I go, is that a solution or a benefit? And they're like, well, data import sounds like a solution. So now I'll just do the why. That, what you gave me wasn't really like that, but I'll use why to get even deeper. So why is data import from the previous year beneficial to you? Right. And why is that beneficial? There you go. See, I'm like a little toddler. Why? 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 But I eventually got to save time, right? And so that's what you see each time you ask. I'm going to talk about this in a sec. It's called a benefit ladder, where the first answer you get is like, imagine. A Whoa, the battery just died. Right. Pass up the swap. Thanks, man. Hot swap. You want to take that? Get sure. that? Look at that. Back up. Look at that. Excellent. Ah, we had the MVP mic. We pivoted. Um, cool. So, you know, it's called a ladder, and it's like a rung of the ladder, basically. I got Each time I say why, I'm getting you to go to a higher level benefit. Awesome. So those are all great examples that you gave me. Um, sometimes it's helpful just to know what's the overall market opportunity we're going after. And I would say something like, help me prepare my taxes, help me do my taxes. That's too high level to be actionable, right? And I don't have my onion slide, but imagine an onion and with all the layers. You got to peel the onion in the problem space, right? And um, let's see what we got here. Yeah, cool. So if we were on the TurboTax team, what we want to do is say, OK, that's our goal. This is the fun part where it's like, let's explore the problem space, what I call exploring the problem space, and brainstorm what are all the different ways we could help people with their taxes, right? Not saying we're going to do them. This is like brainstorming rules apply. Um, it can help you check your taxes. Somebody mentioned accuracy, right? 
It can help you file your taxes instead of having to print them out and take it to the post office. You can just e-file and save you time. It can maximize your deductions, very important, save you some money. It can reduce your auto risk. These are just four examples and you all gave me a lot of other great ones, right? So that's what you want to do with your team is just brainstorm all the different things you could do within that market opportunity you're going after and then kind of clean up the list, dedupe it and clean it up, right? And then what you want to do is create what I call your problem space definition. And what you want to do is kind of put related benefits together. Oops. You want to put related benefits together, right? And at this level, these are distinct benefits. This is what I call atomic benefits. Like help me reduce you know, my audit risk, check my return, help me pay my taxes. Those are distinct benefits. But if I do the technique that I just did with the why, 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 I might find that even though they're distinct at that first level, they all ladder up to the same overall benefit of empowerment or confidence, right? And the way that narrative might go is, well, before TurboTax, I used to do my taxes by hand. I'm not really good with numbers or computers. or I mean, you know, I'm not good with numbers, and I don't know the tax code, so I'm sure I'm doing this wrong. They're probably going to find me. And then a friend recommended TurboTax to me. It kind of held my hand, guided me through, you know, asked me some questions I could answer. Next thing you know, I'm done with my taxes. I feel a lot more empowered or confident, right? That, that would be the confidence benefit ladder. There's a whole distinct benefit ladder which has to do with save time, which we touched on over here. Save time preparing my taxes, of which not having to re-enter data from last year would be a component of that, as well as save time filing taxes, right, instead of having to print it and mail it. And as well as save money, whether it's maximizing your deductions or saving you money compared to a CPA. So this is what I call a problem space definition. Um, you might get excited and say, cool, we'll have three or four levels. Honestly, you only need two levels. You need your cleaned up, dedupe list of atomic benefits, organized by the benefit ladder that they correspond to, right? That's the idea. And then from there, we'll brainstorm, okay, if we want to do this, what are the solution ideas that go with each one of these problem space boxes? We want to have that tight mapping of problem to solution. Now, I, want to provide that, I wanted to provide that foundation on problem space and customer needs, and now we're going to say, okay, how does this apply to product strategy? Because someone mentioned roadmaps. A lot of the roadmaps that I see, and I want you to think about the roadmaps that you see, do they tend to be more in solution space or more in problem space? Unfortunately, the ones that I see are more in solution space. It's like security, integrations, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's, just, it's literally you're looking at the code base. You're, you're like, okay, here's the front end code, here's the back end code. Like that's in the roadmap, right? And so, you, you know, you want your strategy and your roadmap to be grounded in problems. So now we're going to transition to, great, how do we get clear on that product strategy layer of which problems should we solve? and how are we gonna do this in a way that's better and different than the competition? And before I moved out to Silicon Valley to go to business school, I actually got a master's degree in industrial engineering where I learned lean manufacturing, and I learned the Kano model. And the Kano model is a very good uh, model, and I like to apply it to do your value prop, your kind of product strategy grid. So let me explain that to you real quick. It was created by Professor Kano from Japan, kind of with like the total quality movement, the auto manufacturing movement um, back in the day. And it also talks about customer needs. So on the x-axis, for whatever need we're talking about, save time, save money. Where's the Energizer Bunny when you need him? Do you have, here, there's one more. There's another, don't worry. Princess Lay is here to save us all. Here we go. We have triple redundancy, my friends. Uh, but can we get batteries in the other one? Is that cool? All right, get batteries on the other one then because who knows how long we have on this one, y'all. <laughs> the estimated life is 15 minutes based on the data we have to date. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk really fast, no. So whatever needs you have, there it goes. Oh, <laughs> wah, wah. Okay, well luckily I have a loud voice. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, that's cool. So we have this for that and we'll see if we get, okay, so anyway, so whatever need you have, save time, save money, right? Um, is like how fully does the product meet the need from not at all 0% to all the way 100%, okay? Now on the, on the Y axis is as a result of how much the product meets the need, how much satisfaction is results or dissatisfaction. People, people can be happy or they can be unhappy. Now this seems kind of complicated. The cool thing about the Kano model is there's three categories. Really it's a categorization scheme for needs. There's three categories. The easiest to get your head around, the simplest is a performance benefit, okay? The way to read this is left to right. As a product meets the need more and more, more and more user satisfaction is created, right? That's the idea. 
Um, and if you read it right to left, then you know, the less the product meets the need, the more unhappy the customer is. That's what more is better, less is worse. If we were in the microprocessor chip business, and everybody else's microprocessor chip was like 10 gigahertz, but ours was 20 gigahertz, we'd be outperforming everybody by 10 gigahertz. That's the thing about performance benefits, is there's usually a way to quantify the benefit. We're 10% better, we're 15% faster, something like that, 20% cheaper, things like that. Um, let's talk about another example. Let's say I'm shopping for a new car, and I go out to the showroom, and there's two cars, and I like the way they look about the same, and I, uh, I read the little spec sheet on the window, and the specs are pretty comparable, and the price is pretty comparable. Everything seems pretty comparable, but then I realize, hey, wait a minute, this car has twice the miles per gallon as this car. All other things being equal, I'm going to pick the car with the higher fuel efficiency. So for most people, fuel efficiency is a performance benefit, right? So again, performance, more is better, less is worse. The second category of needs is must-have needs. Um, here's how they respond. Now, to, let's start actually over here. Let's assume for a minute the product meets the need with 100%, right? It doesn't, the reason the line's here is it doesn't make anybody happy. That's the point. If it made people happy, it would be up here, but it's not. And, but the way to read it is as you go to the left, as the product fails to fully meet the must-have needs, then people get more and more unhappy. That's the definition of a must-have. I know must-have is a term that gets thrown around pretty loosely, especially by hippos and key stakeholders. We must have this feature. But this is the Kano model definition of a must-have feature, right? Um, let's illustrate it again with cars. Say I was shopping for a new car. I go into the showroom. I see this car. I'm, I, oh my gosh, I love the way this car looks. The price is great. I look at the specs. Everything's amazing. And then I peek my head in the car, and I realize, hey, wait a minute. For some reason, this car doesn't have seat belts. Right? I wouldn't, despite all the other cool stuff about the car, I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't buy it because uh, I'd be afraid of getting hurt or dying, right? But if car A has five seatbelts and car B has 100 seatbelts, I don't say car B is 20 times better than car A. Once you have one seatbelt per person, you've fully met the need and you've done it, right? So these are just like the must-haves, you know, like if you're in health healthcare, like HIPAA compliant. You just have to be HIPAA compliant. If you're not, you're kind of dead in the water, right? So that's the must-haves. And then the third category is delighters. So the way to read this is not having a delighter doesn't cause any problems because people aren't expecting the delighter to be there. It's like a bonus that's not there, right? Uh, but they're not expecting. But by having a delighter, it can create a lot, also called the wow feature, it can create a lot of customer value, right? Um, I just checked into a hotel after I flew in. Um, it was not the hotel chain that gives you chocolate chip cookies when you check in. Does anybody know which one that is? Everybody knows. Is that a delighter? Right? Isn't that a bonus? The first time you got it, like, oh, yes, I could use some chocolate chip cookies, right? Thank you very much, right? But you don't go to the other hotels going, where am I? I'm not checking in until I get my chocolate chip cookies, right? That was, it, it's a delighter, right? It's like, it's a bonus, right? And um, going back to cars, um, like, let's say GPS navigation. Not today, but when GPS navigation came out built into the cars, the first cars that had it, it was a delighter, right? What problem did that solve? Let's use our problem space muscles again. What problem does GPS navigation solve? Avoid getting lost. What else? Yeah, figuring out how to get to where you want to go. Something like, we can probably say it more eloquently, right? But how do I drive to point B, maybe the fastest path, but at least how do I get there? Okay. And before GPS navigation in cars, what were the solutions that people would use for that? Maps. I know everyone here, a lot of people here are way too young to be like, a map? What is this strange object you see? <laughs> but we literally would have these big fold-up maps in our car. You'd unfold it, try to figure out where you're going. Um, for a while, you could go to MapQuest and print it out, but there was no Wi-Fi in the car. So you had to print it and bring it in the car with you, right? Memorize it. So memorize it. There's two other solutions people would use. You'd wing it and get lost if you were too proud, or you'd ask for directions if you could swallow your pride and ask for directions. That's right. So those are all solutions to the problem. And then GPS navigation comes along, you just put in the address of where you're going, fundamentally changes, right? It's a delighter, because it, it, it totally is a new delightful solution. But then what happened over time? More and more cars got GPS navigation. Garmin and TomTom Tom came out with their add-on units, and now we just all use our phones. Which also illustrates that the problems, the need to figure out how to drive to where you're going, that didn't change through all those technology waves. So problems, the lifetime of a problem is much longer than the lifetime. These solutions come and go, right? So, and it also shows you that, you know, 
we all take GPS navigation for granted today, right? So these things, it's not a static picture. These needs and features migrate over time so that yesterday's delighters become today's performance features, become tomorrow's must-haves. And the pace with which that happens just depends on the level of competition and innovation in your space. Um, right, and the last thing I'll say about delighters is people think when they try to brainstorm delighters, usually I do a lot of these sessions with teams, like, what if it automatically, figure, it automatically figures out what you want to eat for lunch and orders it for you? Like, it doesn't have to be some crazy advanced AI thing. We just talked about chocolate chip cookies. The other day I found an amazing delighter on Spotify, right? Anyone here listen to Spotify? Probably, okay. So I'm a Star Wars fan. And when you're on Spotify, you listen to music, it has a little progress bar. It's like the song's three minutes long. It shows you the three minutes going along with a little progress bar. Well, guess what happens if you listen to a Star Wars song? It turns into a lightsaber. And I was like, what? This is totally cool. It's a delighter, right? So delighters do not have to be this huge scope items. It can be chocolate chip cookies or a little lightsaber graphic. Okay, so why am I telling you all this about the Kano model? All you need to take away from this is, hey, there are three categories of needs, must-have performance delighters that have these profiles. And what we're going to do is use them to populate, to create our product strategy grid. The way we do this is step one, we list one per row in this table. What are the must-have benefits that are relevant for our category? What are the performance benefits that are relevant? What are the delighter benefits? So I've kept it generic here so you can maybe envision what it might be for your product space. I'm going to talk about a very specific example in a sec. The second step is you create a column for each of your key competitors that you're trying to outperform, right? And you basically um, create a column for yourself. Right, that's what you do. And you know, I've shown two competitors here to keep it simple. You know, five, six is cool. You probably don't want 20, you might get a little overwhelming. The next thing you want to do is you want to score your competitor. How good a job does each competitor do on each benefit, basically, right? And honestly, low, medium, high usually works good enough, right? So just low, medium, high, as long as the relative scores on a row make sense, right? So what is this saying? This is saying, and you can use yes or no for must-haves, but you know, low, medium, high also works. So uh, must-have benefits, yes, right? They both have it. Both of our competitors have it. Competitor A is the best at performance benefit one. Uh, competitor, you know, competitor B is low with that. Competitor B is the best or the highest at perform performance benefit two. Um, these guys are low. They're both so-so performance benefit three, and these guys have a unique delighter, right? This is where you want to keep that Steve Job quote in mind. Strategy means saying no, right? I run this workshop exercise all the time. I'm going to be doing a workshop tomorrow. We're going to be running this tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and, and some teams cannot help but be like, we're going to be high. We're going to win all the things. High, 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 high. Right? You can't. That's not saying no. Like That's saying yes to everything, right? You don't. It's not realistic because you don't have the resources to do it. And it's not going to create a, a, a good positioning in the marketplace. So you want to pick your battle. The whole point is, okay, okay, given this landscape, how are we going to win? What's our plan for how we're going to win, right? So given this backdrop, we might go with this as our, as our product strategy. Of course, we're going to have the must-have. We're going to be medium on this one. We're not going to try to beat A on, on performance benefit one. We're going to say no to performance benefit two. We're not going to worry about that one. And we're going to try to be the best at performance benefit three. Maybe we've identified a market segment that really values that, or maybe we have some technology ideas how we can deliver a better solution for that, right? And then we have our own unique delighter. The whole point of this exercise is to come up with what you think your unique differentiators are going to be. And your unique differentiators are which performance benefit are we going to be the best at? And usually it's just one. Almost always it's just one. There are few rare examples where it's more than one. And what unique delighters, if any, do we have, right? That's what makes your product special. You don't compete on must-haves, right? And the next step in the product process would be to do your MVP. We want to know this because as we go to spec out our MVP, guess what? Our MVP better have some features that support this benefit and that support this delighter, right? Otherwise, what are we testing with our MVP? Because this is still a hypothesis, right? Okay, so that's a simple framework and how you can do it. Now I want to bring it to life with a real world example to close out here. Um, who's familiar with Instagram? All right, that's why I pick it, great. We're gonna talk about Instagram, but not today, right? We're gonna all hop in a hot tub time machine and we're gonna go back to 2010 when Instagram's logo looked like this. That's when they first launched, okay? So when they first launched, they were a mobile photo sharing app. There already were a lot of other, it was a pretty crowded market already. There were already a lot of other photo, mobile photo sharing apps in the marketplace. And yet they came into the market and they quickly shot up to number one and they've pretty much been there ever since, right? And you don't see that that often, but every once in a while you see this pattern of new product goes into a crowded market and shoots up and becomes number one. 
I would argue every single time you see that dynamic happen, you can reverse engineer to explain why using a product strategy grid that, you know, to figure out what were the unique differentiators that created so much more value than all the other products that they stole the market share and became the leader, right? So let's try to do that with Instagram. So to do that, we need to figure out the unique differentiators. Again, those are what if any unique delighters they had and what if any performance, but not today. I know they have tons of features today. So, it, you know, for people that were around back in 2010 using V1 or V1.1 of Instagram, you know, how do they out delight the other mobile fishing apps or how do they outperform? And again, the key for performance is there's something you can quantify or measure. What do we got? What thoughts do we have? Filters. All right, cool. Number one answer I usually get is filters. Then I go, I like to ask, are filters a solution or a problem? Fine, no problem. I'm going to use my why hack and say, why is a filter, why is an Instagram user's were filter valuable to you? I want to look good. Cool. Anything else? Okay. I want, yeah, right. So I get a lot of nuanced answers. I want my photos to look artistic. I want to look good. I want my photos to look better. I want my photos to look unique. They're all different ways of saying, like, hey, make my photos look better, something like that, right? So we've got the benefit, make my photos look better, supported by the solution filters. Now, when they came out on Instagram, were solutions a performance or a delighter? Yeah, because nobody else had these amazing filters. You see your friend's pictures like, whoa, how'd you get that? What, what? You know, it's like, well, how'd you do that, right? So it was a delighter, right? How about if we were to launch, we were to get together and launch a mobile photo sharing app in 2022? Would it have to have filters or not? We'd get laughed out of the app store, right? So remember how I said those that they evolve over time? Filters went from a delighter when they first came out in Instagram and quickly everybody copied it and now it's like gosh you better have filters or else I'm not going to use your app excellent okay cool so we got we got one delighter filters that make my photos look good what other things do we how else do they outperform or out delight the other photo sharing apps any other thoughts they had a fast upload that's right so let me tell you about this so if you were to take a stopwatch and you took all the other v1 G, your first gen mobile photo sharing apps on 3g and you uploaded your photos it would take like five to seven seconds. You know, it would vary and stuff like that, but it would take like five to seven seconds. But when you uploaded your photos on Instagram, it would be like two or three seconds faster. Like you, if you just stopwatched it, it would be two or three seconds faster. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. I want to, I want to pro, I'm going to tell people we have some engineers in the house, right? So, so if we're using, if the, the only difference is the app and I'm on the same phone, I'm using the same camera. It's got the same megapixels. The file size is the same, right? Mm-hmm. The bandwidth is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Same phone, right? Same 3G or Wi-Fi. Uh, how can they get it up there two or three seconds faster? Do they have some crazy compression that nobody else has? No, they don't. Their Weissman score is the same as everybody else's. So how do they get it up there so quick? It's like you said, they, it was the UX team that came up with it. The UX team said, you know what? The way these apps work is you would basically line, you launch the app, you have the camera, you take your picture, and then it would show you the photo you just took. And that's where you would kind of tag it, do the filters, and then it'd have the upload or share button, right? Well, they basically said, you know what? Like 90 plus percent of the time, people upload the photo. So why are we sitting around waiting? Let's just upload it the second they take it. We'll still let them do all their doodling and stuff and still hit the button. It's going to seem and feel like it's two or three seconds faster. So the UX team came up with that clever hack, and it was two or three seconds faster, right? So that was a performance benefit because you could quantify the upload time, right? And if you think about it, for power Instagram users, how many photos are they uploading a day? You're saving me two or three seconds multiple times a day. That really adds up. Cool. So we got our performance. There's one other thing they did to make your photos look better that's a little more subtle than the filters. Square aspect ratio. That's right. I remember the first time I used Instagram and I pulled it up and it was a square. It cropped my picture to a square. It was the first app that ever constrained my aspect ratio. And I was like, who gave you the right to crop my phone? I was a little upset, right? But, and, and then you'd be like, why are they doing this, right? So the reason why they do it, it's kind of subtle, is, again, the UX folks, is when you take a picture on a phone, it can be a tall rectangle like this, or it can be a wide portrait rectangle like this. Either way, the photo's going to look good, especially with the filters. But when you go to put those in a single feed for people to look at, these have a certain pixel width. These have a wider pixel width. These are going to have to get shrunk down. You're going to have like two different zoom ratios of your photos. It's going to look yucky. It's not going to look, you know, really great. So that's why they said, let's just avoid that whole issue. We're going to force everybody to do square photos so the feed looks good. That's exactly right. All right, cool. So we have, great job, everybody. That was pretty quick, and we got all the things. So here's how I would recreate the problem solution space 
thing for Instagram, right? Problem, make my photos look good, supported by filters and the square aspect ratio. Post my photos quickly, supported by that clever photo upload UX act, right? Does this make sense, right? Okay, and then now we have what we need to make the product strategy grid for Instagram. So here's Instagram. We have our must-haves performance delighters. We have all the other first-generation photo sharing apps, and we have Instagram. We didn't even talk about the must-have. Obviously, if you're a photo sharing app, you need to let me share my pictures. Everybody does that. But we uh, have the performance benefit, post my photos quickly. Everyone else is taking five to seven seconds. We're doing it two or three seconds faster because of that photo upload UX hack. And then we're making your photos look good because we've got these awesome filters that nobody else does. And we're making your feed look awesome because you know we have a square aspect ratio, right? So their unique differentiators were these. And I didn't mention it, but usually, you know, you don't compete on must-have. So you want to find at least one performance benefit that you can outperform on. And if you can have one clear outperform plus a unique delighter, that's a very powerful combination. Time and again, when you do see a company really be successful or really take over a market, it's because they had a very compelling performance benefit like this plus a delighter. Now, sometimes when I tell this story, um, you know, like you would never see Dan's grid in any internal documents from, Insta from Instagram probably, right? They, they wouldn't have done it that, like the way I would do it. Um, but every once in a while I get someone say, hey, that's a, that's a cool story, but how do we know this is, you're just not like revisionist history making this up. Well, luckily for me, a um, couple things. One is that wasn't their first product. So they actually pivoted to Instagram. They initially did a, a, a social networking product called Bourbon that had a more robust feature set. And what they saw from and learned from their users was, you know, users don't seem to care about most of the functionality, but they really like the photo sharing. So why don't we pivot and just focus on the photo sharing and how can we make the best photo sharing app that we can? And that led them to this. The other thing is, luckily for me, I wouldn't, they, their tagline back in 2010 is very powerful and tells you that they knew what they were doing. It was very deliberate. I wouldn't expect anybody to remember it, but again, it was also shared in PowerPoint presentations at the time. Their tagline was fast, beautiful photo sharing. Now, I love this. It's just four words, but they managed to pack their whole value, their product strategy grid into four words. They have their must have photo sharing. We're a photo sharing app. That's what we do. We've got our outperformance here. We're faster than everybody else. We have faster uploads. Maybe their app launches faster. Maybe it runs faster. You know, everything's faster to save you time. And we make your photos look more beautiful than any other app, right? Yeah, today we have these filters. And then what are we doing in the future? And that's a, the beauty of when you have such a clear product strategy. It's long term, right? You can imagine there are teams devoted to each of these different things. Yeah, this is how people want to share photos today. What are we doing in the future to expand the sharing options? Yeah, we're doing this to make it fast today. What can we do to make it even faster in the future? Yeah, we've got these filters. What are we doing to make it more beautiful in the future? So hopefully you, the product strategy grid is something you can see how you could apply to make sure your product is differentiated and going to win in the marketplace. So I want to thank everybody for um, listening to my talk. I do want to share that meetup that I mentioned. So I've got over 11,000 members. We took it online with COVID. It's still online. So we have a lot of people actually from Colorado uh, that, that come in. So you can go to that URL and check it out. And then I am teaching a workshop tomorrow at Industry Rhino Station. Um, there are some tickets left available. If anybody's interested, you can go to that URL and check it out. And then I'll leave this slide about happy to answer questions. Here's how to get a hold of me. If you want to copy my slides or you want and you can give me some feedback, you can just hold up the, your, your phone to the QR code or go to that URL. Um, oh, oh, there's also there's a happy hour like uh, Adam mentioned. It's right nearby here at 1500 Market at Homebot. We're going there in about 15 minutes. I'm going to be there. So it'd be great to catch up with you all there. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions people have. So why don't we use the mic? Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Questions? You got a question? All right. I'm going to I'm going to take speaking of all this photo talk got me thinking. Let me take a picture real quick. Okay, Chi, don't blink. Uh, no, it didn't crop. See, you have the freedom. Apple gives you the freedom. They are not aspect ratio tyrants like Instagram. Dan, I got a question back here. Uh, all right. Yeah, how do you know you have an atomic problem? Like, how do you know you boiled it down enough where it should be able to be matched up to a solution? Um, yeah, that's, you know, I guess you could theoretically have something that's too high level. I think you'll usually know it. I mean, you know, like if I said, hey, we want to save you time on your taxes, I think your team would be like, okay, there's like 10 different ways we could save time, right? So usually you start at the bottom and the challenge is how do we organize it into clusters or, or ladders? 
Um, and like, you know, like we were talking about what do filters do? Some people said, makes me look better. Someone said, makes my photos look more artistic. And you have to decide. It's kind of like, you know, like when you do the post-it notes and you do clusters, you have to decide, do these go together or not? It's really like, you know, it's really, so you could theoretically not be too detailed, but usually if you just let your team kind of brainstorm, they're usually at the right level of detail. And then it's more a question of how do you cluster them to, to ladder them up into ladders, I would say. So, yeah, yeah. But I, I guess another way to answer your question is, I didn't show it, is when you start to brainstorm solutions, if you start to find that the solutions associated with the, a problem box are actually solving slightly different problems, then that might be a hint that you should break it down further, I guess. Other questions? Yes? Sure. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Sure. Do we um, get any batteries for the other thing or no? No, okay. When Not a delighter. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. When you broke down the strategy, you talked a lot about functionality. Uh, I work in a B2B space. Would you consider price part of your strategy? And would that be more of like a performance metric? Or how do you think about okay, price? Okay, okay, okay. So once I, I'll answer your question, but what made you think I was talking about functionality? Ooh. Go ahead, tell me. What, what gave you, what, what, the question was, the question was really about how do we think about pricing, which I'm going to answer in a sec, but there was a little prelude to that, which was, you talked about functionality. I was curious, where did that come through? Maybe just an assumption. Okay, because I tried very hard to stay in the problem space, right? I, I never really talked, so like all these things are in the problem space here. So anyway, it's fine, it's fine. It's th there's implied functionality, obviously, right? So that's cool. But to answer your question was really about pricing. So pricing, the way I like to think about it is, and this kind of gets to the importance versus satisfaction, which I didn't have time to cover today is, if you can think about there's a way to quantify value, right? And I'll not acknowledge it's fuzzy. The clearest thing I can do, especially in B2B, is say, let's say I have a B2B tool that's going to save you 10 hours a week. You have in your workflow that you've got to do, whatever it is, say you're an accountant or something, my tool is going to save you 10 hours a week. And you can see that it's going to save you 10 hours a week. And we know that your time is worth 1000 bucks an hour. So then, you know, $10,000, I'm saving you $10,000 a week. So how much can I charge you? I can't charge you 11,000 because that's not going to be good, right? Maybe I can charge you 8,000, 7,500, maybe 8,500, right? So that's kind of, it's kind of like the way I like to think about it is you're creating a certain value. Even if you can't measure it, you know, I picked a very specific case where you can measure it. Even if you can't measure it, then basically you can charge for it. And so the way to think about pricing is for the value that we're giving you, how much of a discount are you getting? And so, yes, you can give a bigger discount and you can outperform that way or you can outperform people. So pricing tends to be a performance thing. And uh, you got to be careful, though, because if you have a price war, it can be like a race to the bottom. Usually those price wars are kind of like a nuclear uh, approach where it's like, okay, we're just going to drive the other guy out of business and then we're going to have a monopoly and then we're going to jack up the prices. Like that's when you see these kind of older school price wars that go on, you know what I mean? So you got to be careful with that. The other thing I would say is if you think about like hotels, motels, and like luxury hotels, there's a price quality trade-off. There's like a positive slope of, okay, the more we give you, the more we're going to charge. The more value we're creating, the more we're going to charge, which is why you see a lot of SaaS products, they end up having tiers. They start out with one product, like Box was a client of mine. They had one product, and then they realize over time, hey, different clients have bigger needs and more stuff, right? So either transaction volume or seats or file, whatever it is, you find ways to, it's called price discrimination, where you're really doing like, okay, value discrimination. You're saying, okay, you have simple needs. We're gonna create a simple solution that creates this much value and charge you this. And hey, bigger bigger client with bigger needs, we're gonna, you know, this much value and charge you this. So and long story short, it's a performance benefit. And you have to figure out what that discount is. Yeah. All right. Does this work now? How do you get the organization to focus on problems, not solutions? Yeah, so, yeah, the question was, how do you get the organization to focus on problems, not solutions? It can be very tough, right? Um, especially engineering, not, you know, engineering, again, they live in the problem space. So, you know, a lot, of, and it's kind of the default way of thinking. So it's a learned thing over time. The best thing you can do is just when somebody's proposing a solution, is just say, hey, can you help me understand? I hear, you know, you don't challenge them. You just say, hey, I hear you asking for feature X. Um, can you help me understand how that's going to create value for customers? Especially in B2B, I have a, whole, a talk I just gave a few months ago on enterprise PMs. If anybody's an enterprise PM, I recommend listening to that. A lot of people that listen to that were like, have you been inside our company? How do you know? Like, this is exactly the kind of problems I'm dealing with, right? So it's like therapy for y'all. But one of the things that happens is 
clients dictate solutions, right? The big clients, the Fortune 500 people are like, we need you to build Feature X for a little startup A, you know, SaaS startup, build us this. And you're just so excited to have a deal with Fortune 500 company, whoever, that you're like, yes, ma'am, we'll do it. Yes, sir, we'll do it. And you go and you build it. The number of times I've seen the little startup build what the big client asked for, and then it doesn't get used, it's sad. It's really, but, and it's because they were in the solution space, they weren't clear on what problem was gonna solve for them. So it's a tough thing, it's, you know, it's, but um, it's really just, it's really just, you have to start with uh, the product management team, I think, and you start asking good questions in your team meetings. When somebody proposes a feature, you just kind of have your little radar go off and you go, and if it's a little bug fix or some little small thing, you let it go. But if it's like, we need to spend three months to build this thing, that might be when you want to get clear on the problem and make sure we're clear on the problem and we validate it with customers and things like that. The bigger the investment, the more it's worth trying to figure out what and validate what the problem is. Other questions? Yeah. There you go. Do you do you revisit this over time and see as things change? So the customer feedback comes in and yeah. what was and you know you talked about things moving along that path from yeah. being a delighter to being a performance yeah. indicator. Like, how do you go back and, and look at where it was and where it is now? And so the to question was, you know, how often do you look at this again and potentially update it? Right. I think it's in the order of like years like two or three years to be honest with you right again remember the strategy is long term not short term right um if you're constantly rearranging the deck chairs like oh now it's about this now it's about this then i don't think that's really being those aren't irreversible decisions so and in my book i talk about how you can i showed this kind of as a static this is like right now like, there's a question of what's the time frame of this analysis right like when do we plan to achieve this and this comes up in my workshop too people will put up some grandiose product strategy I'm like, okay, you have 18 months of funding. <laughs> Is it realistic that you can do this in 18 months? And then they go, oh, not really, right? So, you know, it can change over time. Uh, it can change over time. Um, so it's kind of like your initial one, and then you might add rows over time, you know, or as you identify new segments. Um, so, and it, but in my book, I have a way of, a way of like, you can do like a future version of it. This is like kind of a snapshot now, and then you can say, okay, three years from now, where do we expect, these competitors aren't standing so either, they're moving, so where do we expect them to be? And you can kind of do a projection of it in the future as well. So I think, you know, every two or three years, or if some major new competitor enters the market, you probably want to update it. So. All right, other questions? We got time for questions, it's not even five yet. Yes? Um, is this framework uh, the same for a SaaS product or versus a tech-enabled service? I, I would say yes. I think basically, you know, it's funny because a lot of the examples I give are B2C and then I get someone from B2B going, does this apply to B2B? And what I do is I just go back to this and I say, don't you have customers you know, that you have to meet needs of? regardless of what type of solution you're building, you know, don't they have needs? Don't we need to do so, meet their needs in a way they're in competition? So yes, you can, um, you, you can. And it, one thing that can happen is it might be a little harder to get at some, you, you know, sometimes when you're building a very techie product, the bias to have these things be in the solution space is very high. And so, um, and you know, I didn't really say it, but that whole problem space solution space, we all have heard statistics like 80% of new projects fail or 90%. I think the top reason is because they weren't clear on the problem and they didn't validate it. Let's go build this thing, right? Like I talk about the Segway. The Segway, the guy was like all excited to build the Segway and you know, you know, it didn't really pan out the way he was hoping. But he was enamored with the technology of solution, right? And he, and he didn't say, okay, what problem can it solve? Let me go actually talk to customers and validate that that's an important problem for them. This happens all the time, right? Blockchain. Let's build blockchain! Ah! You know, the, I don't know if saying blockchain isn't useful, but is blockchain a solution or a problem? Oh. Mm. <laughs> there you go. Is uh, AI a solution or a problem? Is deep learning a solution or a problem, right? So you get these, you know, the tech du jour, and it's everyone's like, ah, it's like gnome underpants, right, from the South Park. It's like, step one, no blockchain. Step three, profit. Hmm, middle age. Step two, what do we do, right? So anyway, um, I think, yeah, you know, especially in tech products, you should, even though it's harder, you should try to get clear on the benefits. Okay. 
All right, well, we're at five, so I'm happy to answer questions, and then I'm happy to answer more questions with some beverages in our hands over at the happy hour that's right around the corner at HomeBot. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming, and I'll see you later.